Good afternoon. I'm uh, Bill Hong. I'm the National Secretary of the Pen Collectors of America, and I'm here to introduce Mr. Jeffrey Parker, who is the great grandson of George S. Parker, the founder of the Parker Pen Company, who uh, began the company in Janesville, Wisconsin, in 1888. And uh, after that time, we created uh, that company was responsible for, for creating some of the iconic pens of the 20th century, such as the uh, dual fold, the vacuumatic, the 51, which turns out to be not only probably the most uh, uh, mass or the most produced pen of the 20th century, the most produced fountain pen ever, but also probably the most widely imitated fountain pen ever. Um, as well as uh, the 75 fountain pen uh, and the Jotter ballpoint pen, which have also become iconic in their own ways. And uh, today, even now, the Parker Pen Company is bringing out new pen lines all the time. So uh, it's still a very vital and uh, active company. For that reason, we're very honored to have Mr. Parker come and speak to us about some of uh, his remembrances of uh, family history. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Well, uh, that's a very nice introduction. Uh, it's uh, obviously, admittedly, it's a very brief summary of 120 plus years of Parker Pan history. Um, I'm going to try and fill in some of the details. Uh, and the reason I'm going to do that is because even though I'm the fourth generation in the, uh, in the Parker family since the business was started, I sort of, because of that, I sort of, I sort of fell into the business. Um, it was well established and very healthy by the time I was born. But of course, it wasn't always that way. Um, and so I thought I'd go back and provide a little history on just how some of these uh, iconic uh, pens came to be, who some of the people were behind them, and what motivated the people. Um, so I guess the place to start is that um, my great-grandfather, George S. Parker, who founded the company, uh, was born uh, in a very rural part of Wisconsin in 1863. His father was a nurseryman, uh, and the family was, uh, well, they, they weren't well off at all, but, uh, but they were all very happy. The family moved uh, shortly after George was born. He was the seventh of eight children. Uh, and they moved from the southeastern corner of Wisconsin to northeastern Iowa. That's where George spent most of his life growing up, on the family farm. Uh, I think he learned from a fairly young age that the prospect of becoming a farmer himself or a nurseryman himself was one that didn't appeal to him very much. Uh, he determined this, uh, I've come to learn, because in his journals, he's recounted that one of his favorite things growing up as a child was to read Youth Companion magazine, which was a very popular magazine back in those days. And his favorite things to read were stories about travel. He dreamed of being able to travel, see, meet new people, see new things, and uh, that was a, a kind of a difficult thing to imagine as he was in the middle of Iowa. Uh, but it was something that clearly interested him. By the time he was about 20 years old, he decided that it was time to leave Iowa and to try to start realizing his dream of traveling. There weren't an awful lot of options for that back in those days, especially in that part of the world. And so he identified one, which was he thought he would learn telegraphy. Now, if you're wondering what in the world telegraphy has to do with travel, it's not an obvious connection. But 
at that point in time, the railroads were hiring telegraphers who they would then station throughout their, their, their travel network. So George traveled to the nearest uh, telegraph school, which was in south central Wisconsin in a town called Janesville, not too far away. And he learned telegraphy. He was a pretty quick study, picked it up pretty easily, and graduated and was soon hired by a railroad and dispatched to serve as a telegraph agent. Um, and he was very excited until he learned that he had been assigned to a station in North Dakota. <laughs> well, North Dakota wasn't exactly on his list of places that he wanted to visit. Um, I'm not saying it wasn't near the top. I'm saying it wasn't even on the list. But he went and he did it uh, in the hopes that eventually it would lead him to other opportunities. Uh, he couldn't have imagined the opportunity that came along, though, because not too long after he had settled into this assignment, he was contacted by the school where he had learned telegraphy, and he was asked to return to Janesville uh, to be a telegraphy instructor. Well, I can imagine him wondering, let's see, do I want to go back to Janesville and teach telegraphy, or do I want to stay in North Dakota? Which, oh, wait a minute, I know what to do. I'm going to go back to Janesville. It was a very easy choice for him. So he went back to Janesville uh, in very short order and began teaching. Well, that was great. Uh, he had uh, a steady income. It wasn't a generous income, but it was a steady income. And he looked forward to the opportunity to be able to earn enough money so that he could periodically go out and travel. Well, the problem was that he wasn't earning quite enough money to be able to, to do that. So he spoke with the owner of the telegraph school and said, is there any chance I can get a raise? And uh, that didn't work out too well. So he began thinking, well, how can I earn some more money? And he quickly hit upon the idea of becoming a sales agent for a business called the John Holland Pen Company. He figured this is a natural. He said, I can, I can sell the pens to my students and they can use them uh, as they learn telegraphy. Sounded like a great idea. And it, and it was a great idea. He sold a great many pens to his students. And he said, OK, I'm on my way. Uh, until the pens started leaking, skipping, and malfunctioning in general. Well, it wasn't really his fault. He hadn't made them. But being, having been raised by sound Midwestern values, he felt responsible to correct the faults. Uh, after all, he accepted the money. And uh, so he said, so he, what he did was he went out and he bought some simple hand tools. And he started fiddling with the pens, trying to see if he could figure out a way to make these pens more reliable. And lo and behold, after a great deal of tinkering, he did figure out a way to make them better. And so he corrected the faults for his customers. They were happy. He was happy. But then a light bulb went off. And he said, wait a minute. Why should I fix someone else's pens? Why don't I just make my own pens and incorporate the improvements I've developed into those pens? And so that's exactly what he did. Now, it would be easy to say to, that that was the beginning of the Parker Pen Company, except it wouldn't be quite accurate because he did this on a very, very small scale initially. 
he would have maybe a half dozen pens made up, according to his specification. And because that's all he could afford to have made. And he might sell them to his students. He might find a traveling salesman passing through Janesville who would be willing to take them on and try to sell them elsewhere. But it was, when I say it was small scale, I mean it was very, very small. Uh, but the business went on like that for a few years. And he was soon faced with a decision. Uh, do I want to keep on dribbling out a few pens here, a few pens there, while I continue to teach telegraphy? Or do I make up my mind and I choose one or the other? Well, he obviously chose to commit him, himself and his career to the pen business. That decision was aided considerably by the fact that he met a, an insurance salesman in Janesville back in those days by the name of William Palmer, who was willing to invest $1,000 on the chance that George Parker could really develop his pens into a viable, profitable business. With that $1,000 invested by Mr. Palmer, the Parker Pen Company was formed in as Bill said, 1888. The business continued uh, uh, as a small but successful pen business for some years in Janesville. Uh, the pens were marketed generally regionally around the Midwest, and they came to develop a very favorable reputation for their quality. George never stopped, never stopped trying to improve on the pens. For as much better as his pens were than the John Hollands he first sold, he knew that there are ways that they could be improved. That belief actually became one of the credos of the Parker Pen Company which George often characterized by simply admonishing his employees always make a better pen. Always try to make a better pen. So the business went on kind of moderately successful if you will, uh, but successful enough that he was soon able to start traveling just as he had originally hoped to do. When he was able to travel, he made some interesting discoveries, revelations, you might say. One of them was that um, people who bought his pens tended to use them for important things important things in their personal lives, which is to say they would use them to uh, maybe uh, sign uh, a mortgage when they bought a house uh, or to sign a birth certificate or their children's report cards or things like that. That may sound like a fairly minor thing, but to him it said that these, that these pens were almost a part of the family. They became a part of the family. Um, so much so that people, he learned, would frequently pass these pens from generation to generation. And it was that understanding that led him in some interesting directions. First off, he said, if these are personal items, then why is it that for, by and large, for, for most American pen buyers, why is it that you can buy any color pen that you want as long as it's black? How, how could that, he wondered, how could that possibly 
represent a personal item if they're all identical. So he set about trying to figure out ways that he could make his pens more unique, more personal. One method that was brought, that was suggested by an employee to him was to make a pen that was not black. Seems pretty obvious, doesn't it? It does to us anyway now, but it wasn't obvious back then because the materials at hand didn't, didn't make that easily possible. But nonetheless, he said, okay, I'm going to try it. I'm going to take what was then Parker's standard pen, which was called the dual fold, and it was black. And on a whim, they experimented with the idea of making it, are you ready? Orange. Not black, not conservative navy blue, not some simple conservative color, but in your face, bright Chinese red-orange. Well, actually, to tell you the truth, George wasn't that crazy about the idea. Uh, but as it happened, his sons, including my grandfather, Kenneth, thought it was a great idea. Of course, Kenneth was younger than, was younger, and uh, uh, he just felt more comfortable taking chances. Well, George, George was off traveling when a decision, when Kenneth and his brother Russell decided to make a, a decision. George was in China and, and Kenneth and Russell took it upon themselves to have a batch of these bright orange, red orange pens made up and test market them in Chicago. Well, <laughs> they were wildly popular, uh, beyond anyone's expectations. George returned uh, from his travels in China, heard about it by, when he spotted an advertisement in a newspaper, was very upset <laughs> that his sons had, had tackled this uh, without uh, telling him. but. Once he got home and he found out how successful they were, he was fine. He was fine. So much so that they decided to uh, expand upon the colors. And so over a period of the next few years, they actually added more colors. Uh, a bright mandarin yellow. Uh, a, a, a beautiful lapis blue. Uh, greens, uh, mauves, all kinds of colors. The whole dual fold line became wildly popular. Uh, I believe not just because it allowed people to make a statement by choosing a color, but because the pen was in perfect sync with the times. This was, after all, the Roaring Twenties. And the Roaring Twenties were not a conservative, staid, black time. They were wild, and the pens matched the times. That was another important lesson he learned. So this is how you can take a, what seems like a simple, almost invisible realization that people use pens for personal things. Why not make the pens more personal? And this is something that Parker used all the time uh, going forward, that, that, that simple things can lead to very interesting opportunities. Okay? The, I would suggest that there were a few other opportunities, a few other examples that I can share with you where uh, the, same, the same idea proved true. One that comes immediately to mind was the fact, centered around the fact that, uh, that my grandfather Kenneth, before he joined the, the pen company, 
had an interest in learning to fly. Uh, and so, um, without his father's consent, he joined the United States Navy and traveled to Miami and Pensacola and learned how to fly uh, in 1917. Flying was not <laughs> uh, what we would call a safe thing to do back in those days. But Kenneth, he was passionate about it, and this was what he wanted to do. Well, you're saying, so wait a minute, what, how, could, how could flying possibly have anything to do with, airplane, or with, uh, with pens? Well, uh, Kenneth wasn't exactly sure if it would have any relationship ship himself, but the way it developed was that Kenneth learned pretty quickly that when he went flying in an airplane with a dual fold in his pocket, it was pretty quick that there was a problem that appeared right away in the form of a bright splotch of ink on his pocket. Uh, pens were not very friendly uh, traveling companions in airplanes back in those days. Well, Kenneth had been raised by his father and had been raised by the, the credo that I mentioned earlier, which was always try to make a better pen. Always strive to make a better pen. So he took it upon himself to start developing the technology and the techniques and, if necessary, the materials to make pens more airplane friendly not just because it would be more convenient for him and he would stop uh, getting uh, ink splotched shirts when he went flying, but because he believed that flying was going to develop into something that more and more Americans would do. And so he began the process. It was a very, some would say it's a continuing process to make fountain pens more airplane friendly. Um, certainly, compared to the old days, uh, pens are, uh, well, it's not quite as risky to take a fountain pen on an airplane anymore. Uh, partly that's because of uh, techniques and materials and engineering that Parker undertook at that time. Partly it's because the airplanes uh, have adapted to make them less hostile to fountain pens. But anyway, that's, that's another example of how you can apply a simple, always, make, always strive to make a better pen in, in a direction that George or even Kenneth couldn't possibly have imagined. Um, and I'll give you a few others here. One of, one of the more interesting and subtle discoveries that George made when he started traveling particularly when he started traveling beyond the boundaries of the United States, was that there were opportunities to sell pens, his pens, all over the world. Well, okay, you, you say, well, that seems pretty obvious. Well, it wasn't that obvious back then. Uh, when George, let's put it this way, when George traveled, and he traveled extensively. Uh, he always took a considerable supply of Parker pens. When I say considerable, I mean a steamer trunk full of them. Okay? Uh, and, uh, and he really traveled a lot. He traveled, uh, I know of at least seven trips that he made to China alone between 1925 and 1935. Traveling back in those days was not easy. I don't have to tell you that. Uh, but the discovery that he made, and again, it's, it's, it's very subtle, was that he learned very early a, a very simple thing, and that was that his pens were capable of writing in any language. <laughs> Now, I mean, it, we know that. I mean, it's, duh. <laughs> but, but back in those days, there weren't a lot of people who had the opportunity to travel the way George did. 
So he discovered this and he said, wow, I can sell a lot of pens simply by taking along pens when I travel to China or Japan or South America or Europe or wherever it was that he would travel. And so when he traveled, when, when a ship that he was traveling on put in, the very first thing George would do would be to get off of the ship with a briefcase full of pens and he would head out into the town and start visiting local banks, perhaps the local Standard Oil facility, uh, as they were everywhere back in those days, uh, maybe the, the, the city government, and he would try to find, try to zero in on an honest, reputable businessman in the area who would be a good fit for his products. And then he would hightail it straight to that person, sit down and say, would you be interested in carrying my line of pens? And this, so think about this. We're talking mid-1920s in China, uh, which was not a, a very friendly place back in those days. And this, this American is just launching straight into the community, and he wants to sell pens in China. Well, uh, it worked. It worked very, very well. Uh, so, so well, in fact, that by the immediate post-war era, post-World War II era, that is, uh, the majority of Parker Penn's sales, overall sales, were from outside the United States. Now, think about that for a second. The world today is very international, but the world wasn't anywhere near what it is now back in the 1940s. Uh, I would like to say that, uh, that, it's, that it was an inspiration that, that, he could, uh, that he could expand his business and, uh, uh, and such, but it was this very simple, subtle, little, mini eureka, you might say, that George had that his pens would write in any language. Uh, totally unexpected. When he's, I think it's very easy to, to, to overlook the fact that when George started the pen business, he had no idea where it was going to go. No idea. Uh, but he was the sort of person who paid attention to little things both in the way he designed and engineered the pens that he made and in his life. Now, part of the way, part of the reason that he was able to zero in on these little details, that's an interesting story in itself because George was a firm believer in the idea that to grow as a person or as a business, you had to be able to learn from your mistakes. And he believed that the best way to improve your chances of doing that was to journal. In other words, to keep a personal journal or a diary. And that it was by doing this that you had the opportunity to look back in your own time and read about what you did five years ago, ten years ago, two years ago, and think about what you've learned since then. Think about what's happened since then. And then to try to incorporate those uh, revelations, if you will, into uh, his personal life or into the business. Uh, for example, one of the things that he did when he was traveling uh, so much was that he would, uh, uh, he kept a travel journal. And uh, he, uh, uh, 
a copious, detailed travel journal. And he would take these, uh, these notes that he would make every day on where he'd travel, who he'd met, what he'd done, what he'd seen, and he would actually mail these, these travel notes back to Janesville, where the business would then publish them in the company's uh, sort of internal newspaper, if you will. And this way, he was able to share what he was seeing and learning about the world with people back in Janesville who would never have that opportunity, never have the opportunity to go to China. Uh, and in the same breath, he was able to look back at what he had seen in China or Japan or whatever, and maybe think about how that might be incorporated into the business. So again, we have, I bring this up because it's another example of how uh, little things can lead you down very interesting paths. Um, and I can think of a few others that I'll, that I'll share with you. Um, one of the problems that he learned, uh, he learned that the pens that he was making and others were making were most valued by servicemen serving in war and their families. It was very difficult, even now, uh, being able to stay in touch with your family while you're serving overseas is, uh, is, is essential to maintaining morale. Uh, so, but carrying a fountain pen in the trenches of World War I was not a very practical thing to do. So he developed what he thought would be a way to facilitate that. So he developed what, we're, what we would basically call ink pills small tablets of concentrated ink that all a, all, a, all a serviceman would have to do, whether he was in the trench or back in his camp, would be to take one of these little tablets and drop it in a little cup of water, instant ink. And he could then fill up his pen, write a letter to the folks back home, tell them he was fine, and it seemed to work very, very well. So you can appreciate that there are a lot of subtle ways that, uh, that George and his sons and uh, the rest of the family and the business uh, learned how to uh, not just make a better pen, but how to communicate uh, their commitment, not just to pens, but to communication and sharing uh, in some very interesting ways. So that's the main thought that I, that I want to leave you with. Um, and I guess the simplest, rather than me just stand up here rambling on and on, uh, I think maybe the, the best thing to do at this point in time would be maybe to ask any of you if you have any personal recollections or questions uh, that relate not necessarily to just to Parker, because I do know something about the competition too. Uh, uh, and uh, see if I can't uh, see if I can't field some of your questions. Anybody have any? Yeah. So, um, so ink pills. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. How long were those made? Were well, they were. Uh, they were generally just popular during the war. That said, I I can think of one other example where a similar sort of product was developed much later, but it was. Back in those days, uh, traveling with an ink bottle sounds pretty scary to us these days, uh, but uh, it, it was pretty common. And actually, there were special um, 
cases, yes. You, you, you probably saw some outside. Special cases that were, um, well, pretty secure way of carrying around ink. I won't say totally secure because I'm, I've heard some, <laughs> some horror stories about it. Nowadays, of course, it's almost impossible for us to imagine traveling around with a bottle of ink. Not even I travel with a bottle of ink now. Okay? Uh, three ounces or less. Exactly right. <laughs> exactly right. Good point. Um, but of course, now we have cartridges. Okay? Cartridges, again, I mean, we're, we're so used to cartridge, the idea of a cartridge fountain pen right now that it, it seems so obvious, but it wasn't obvious back in those days. When did they come in? Well, Parker's first cartridge pens came along in the early 60s. Okay? That's, I mean, to me, that's pretty recent. <laughs> Maybe not to you or some of the others, but that's pretty recent history. Uh, just before Parker moved to cartridges, they actually did briefly experiment with an alternative, which was not exactly an ink pill, but it was a small plastic, uh, I'm not sure what to call it. Uh, it. It might look like a cartridge, but this was a device that had powdered ink in it. And the idea was is that you fit this onto the, onto the filling portion of the pen and then dip the pen in water and uh, it would fill with uh, an ink solution. Didn't, didn't last very long. It was messy. Yeah, it was still messy. It was still messy, no question about it. Um, but it was better than carrying around an ink bottle. And it stood, it stood until cartridges came along just a couple of years later. Now, but you raise an interesting question. So uh, think about it. If you had to, are you comfortable traveling with ink cartridges? Okay. This is for that, I oh, I, oh, I thank you so much. That's a perfect answer. <laughs> okay. Well, let, my, let, let, me, let me suggest that the reason for my, for, for my asking you that is that if you think about it, a cartridge seems like a, like a good idea. But a cartridge is hardly a perfect solution uh, to, the, to the, the problem of being able to carry to refill a pen, okay? Uh, the most obvious uh, problem I can see with it, for example, is that while they're convenient, they don't hold very much ink, okay? So it probably won't come as a big surprise to you that this is a subject, this is a, a, a technical issue that Parker and probably many other pen companies are devoting attention to right now. They're trying to figure out, well, maybe how can we make a bigger cartridge? How can we make more concentrated ink that will last longer? There's any number of ways to look at it. But I can assure you that Parker is still following George's credo, always strive to make a better pen. And that's one way that they've identified that they can make a better pen. Uh, any other questions? Yes. Sure, sure. Actually, that's uh, that's a very that's a very apropos question. I and I, and I'll and I'll fast forward I want to the to today, if you will, right today, first by saying that the that I am not personally involved in the business at all uh, at this point in time. So if I'm if I come off sounding like I'm tooting Parker Pen's horn so that you'll all rush out and buy a Parker Pen, rest assured, I will not, if you do that, and that would be wonderful, I will not personally benefit in any way, okay? Uh, but to move back to, to, the, to your question, um, I'll give you a kind of a brief uh, tick-tock of how things went by. So the business was started in 1888. Uh, George Parker was uh, a principal, uh, equal principal, along with William Palmer. 
the Palmer family left the business about 19, in the late 1920s. I'm not going to try and put a year because I don't remember exactly. Uh, and at that point in time, the, they were bought out through a stock offering. So Parker Penn became a public company at that time. The stock was traded, uh, I believe, back in those days on the Midwest Stock Exchange. So the family remained the significant owner, the majority owner, uh, but there were, uh, but just barely. In other words, the family probably held 51% uh, of the business or something like that. Uh, and the business pretty much remained that way until 1937 when George, uh, at the age of 73, uh, passed away. Uh, a little background on that. I mentioned earlier that George had two sons, uh, Russell and Kenneth, my grandfather being Kenneth. Uh, Russell was the elder of the two sons. And, uh, and Russell was actually George's choice to run the business, to, to take over from him. Uh, think back to a second about the story I told you about Kenneth and his flying. Well, <laughs> Kenneth was, how should we say this? Kenneth was a risk taker, okay? At a time in his father's life, when his father was hmm, not a risk taker. Uh, so I think that probably had as much as anything to do with the fact that Russell was chosen as the heir apparent. Now, quirk of fate, call it a quirk of fate, call it uh, destiny, call it whatever you will, but Russell died very unexpectedly at the age of 39 in 1933. And that really didn't fall into George's plans for the business. But he really had very little choice at that point in time but to acknowledge that risk taker or not, Kenneth was his son and uh, was the, if, if the only choice, he was also a good choice, maybe not the perfect choice, to run the business from there on. So Kenneth uh, took over the business in uh, January of 1933 and uh, ran the business um, through what many people would consider its uh, golden era. By that I mean that uh, some of Parker's most famous, best regarded pens came from Kenneth's guidance and leadership of the business. Um, they may not be pens that roll off your lips like uh, the Vacuumatic, uh, which was a pen that Parker developed, uh, believe it or not, during the depths of the Great Depression. A most unusual time to spend lots of money to develop a revolutionary new pen. But again, Kenneth is in charge the risk taker. Uh, and then ultimately leading to the pen that Bill referenced uh, in his introduction, the Parker 51, uh, which it looks like that's what you have. Is it? Yes. It is indeed. And this pen, Bill, was, was completely correct. The 51 is the most produced fountain pen ever. Uh, it came out uh, in about 1940, uh, just as the Second World War was warming up, <laughs> and uh, uh, difficulties with the economy and, uh, and production restrictions uh, uh, under the guidance of the, of the government, notwithstanding, it became an immensely popular pen. Uh, I, the stories about the 51 are, are legion. I, 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 I could easily stand up in here, talk for another 
hour just about the 51. I won't do that to you. I won't do that to you, I promise. But uh, in any case, the 51 came under Kenneth's guys. Kenneth continued to run the business on a daily basis until um, a close friend of the family by the name of uh, Bruce Jeffress ran the business. Um, took over from Kenneth's when, when Kenneth's wife died rather unexpectedly in 1951. Kenneth remained involved in the business, but not so much day to day. Uh, so then we move. Mr. Jeffress ran the business for a relatively short period of time until 1960, when my father took over as president of the business uh, during a, another very interesting time in the pen business. Uh, this is when cartridge pens were coming along. Uh, this was when ball points were, uh, well, becoming pretty well established. Uh, so it was, uh, it was a very interesting time, uh, shall we say. Uh, um, and my father, uh, during the period of time my father ran the business, Kenneth, although basically retired from day-to-day -day work, was still involved in the business and still participated in uh, designing new pens. Uh, he and my father worked uh, very closely together on some other iconic uh, Parker models uh, like the Parker 75, uh, the uh, Sterling Silver Pen, and then, uh, of course, the, the Parker Jotter, which was introduced in 1954. Incredibly, think about how many products you can tick off that are, let's see, 1954 to 2010, what is that, uh, 56 Six. years? 56 years, one product, essentially unchanged and still going strong. Remarkable, totally remarkable. Now I could, we can sort of poo-poo the fact that it's a ballpoint and everyone knows a, no ballpoint will write as well as a fountain pen, but it is very remarkable to have such a successful design for such a long period of time. So anyway, so we move through the 60s, Parker's adapting to new technologies like roller balls uh, and soft tip pens, all of those sorts of things until we hit the early 1980s, when all of a sudden Parker ran into a brick wall, which was people stopped using fountain pens. I won't say stopped, but there was a, there was a major demographic shift that happened during that point in time. And uh, Parker's sales basically fell off a cliff. Now, I won't go into a lot of detail for the period of time from that on because it's a period of time that I'm pretty unfamiliar with. But let's just say the pen business was sold in 1985. The, the family's involvement ceased completely in 1985. There was a management buyout from uh, a management group in England, who'd, all of whom were longtime employees of Parker. They made some very tough decisions, made some major adjustments to the business, and, uh, and were able to successfully turn around the business in 1985. Uh, about uh, seven years after that, uh, the investors in that management buyout uh, decided to sell out their interest, and the Gillette Company uh, bought Parker Penn at that point in time. Gillette owned the business from about 19, if I remember correctly, in 1992 until late 1999, when they finally figured out that they can't sell $300 fountain pens the same way they sell razor blades. And they sold the business to a, another major sort of conglomerate, uh, which is the current owner of the business, and that's a company called Newell Rubbermaid. Newell Rubbermaid, uh, you, we've all heard of Rubbermaid, of course. Uh, 
but Newell Rubbermaid owns lots and lots of different kinds of products from baby strollers to picture frames to fountain pens. Um, they own the business now, they have since about 1999, 2000. Um, and their ownership of the business has been, shall we say, mm, tepidly successful. Uh, as, a, as a kind of a conglomerate, there are a lot of things about uh, expensive fountain pens that they've had a very hard time trying to understand. Doesn't really fit their corporate, uh, what should we call it, personality. Uh, but they are, little by little, uh, becoming more and more familiar with the, the quirks uh, of, uh, of selling uh, what a lot of them originally considered to be buggy whips. Uh, uh, little by little, oh, they're, they're coming around, they're recognizing, well, they're not, they're not buggy whips at all. Um, but that said, the fountain pen business, especially expensive fountain pens like Parker makes, are not mainstream anymore. It's, it's what a businessman would refer to as a niche market, okay? That means, uh, that means you can be in the fountain pen business these days, but you're not going to become a millionaire, okay? That's, to me, that says, okay, what's, I don't have to be a millionaire. I, I could enjoy making pens and being a, uh, something less than a millionaire. I, can, I could enjoy it because, as we say in our family, as every generation in our family has said, we have ink in our veins. Do, do, do you see? It's blue. Yes. Yes? Ooh, that's a great question. I, I, I'm going to have to plead ignorance, though, because I, I simply don't know. I'm going to take a wild guess and say that it's uh, probably 30%. Yeah. Uh, to understand it, though, you have to appreciate the fact that, again, just as back, as I mentioned back right in the 1940s, the majority of Parker sales are not here in the U.S. Overseas. And overseas, outside of the U.S., the world treats fountain pens completely differently than we do here in the United States. Totally differently. There are schools in Europe today, in 2010, where students are required to submit their homework, their papers, in fountain pen. In France. In France. In France. Not ballpoints. Not ballpoints. Ballpoint is not acceptable. Fountain pens. Okay? Uh, it happens. It's, it's as, I, as I described the business, it's a bit of a niche. There are little pockets of, of, of people here and there and all over the world who, who, still, who still understand and appreciate the fact that writing with a fountain pen is something special. It feels special. It, it, it somehow connects, if you know what I mean. It, it just, it seems right. Uh, so um, I won't go off on that one, I promise. That's a tough one. But, uh, but in any case, uh, you said that would be the last question. I, but I will say, we can stick around and okay, I was just going to suggest that if uh, any other questions that uh, any of you would like to ask, I can talk about pens pretty much forever. <laughs> so as long as you want to stick around, I'm happy to answer your questions. Thank you so much. Thank you. My pleasure.